Welcome to the Long Range Pursuit Podcast, presented by Gunworks, where we learn about and share long-range shooting techniques, science, and gear. Welcome back to Long Range Pursuit Podcast. Um, this is an entirely new format that we're testing things out, so um, bear with us, and we definitely appreciate any feedback. So we just barely finished building our new podcast studio here at the Gunworks headquarters. Um, the idea is we can br bring in four plus guys and uh, do kind of a roundtable session. Um, but today we've got a guest on, and so we're testing out this uh, remote setup rather than me just a uh, video of me just talking into a microphone. Uh, we've got James here up on the screen. So uh, I want to introduce James uh, Yates, a good buddy of mine. We go quite a ways back. I've been hunting together for a number of years, and um, we'll kind of dive into the backstory. But you and I met, um, I, I remember our first conversation in the parking lot at Camel Fire Black Ovis. I, used, I worked there for, uh, for those guys down in Utah for a couple of years, a uh, great online retailer for hunting gear and whatever else. But I think you came into the shop. Did you buy a Nikon rangefinder, I think? Is that what it was? Yeah, it was a Nikon. I had... Uh... I had uh, hurt my, I had uh, had an athletic climbing accident, um, kind of injured my finger and was kind of getting all depressed. I'd rifle hunted all my life and my wife suggested to me that I pick up archery because the seasons were longer and I yeah. could practice more. And it was the springtime. We'd actually put in for tags already. And uh, I got on KSL, which is our local classified, uh, you know, classified ads and found a decent bow and... I think late spring, early summer is when we met that year in 2013. And I was just, you know, buying the discounted gear at Camo Fire. And yep. yeah, I think first, one of the first things I bought was, uh, was our, was a range finder. And, uh, that's where, that's where we met. Yeah. So. And I was in the same boat. I, I literally, you know, I did a little bit of playing around with the old, uh, uh, trad bow as a kid, but have never really seriously archery hunted. And I think I had just barely picked up my first bow was just getting it set up and we kind of hit it off and pretty soon we were planning our first archery hunt together. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, we were. Anyways, so, I mean, we spent that, that fall, I remember a couple hunts. Um, uh, did, did you end up killing a, a deer that later that season? We didn't kill yeah, together I, that season, but. No, no, I, I killed in that same unit a uh, little later, later in the year. Yeah. Um, uh, in November, yeah. a section of the unit opens up, is still open and, uh, I, yeah, I took a, a pretty nice tall three point in the snow. Mm. Uh, you're a nice first, first hunt. Uh, I do remember, uh, <laughs> quite vividly. If you remember, I forgot my sleeping bag. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We hiked way back in, in the dark, in the rain. Remember it rained inches oh, and poor. inch. I've never had before or since a, a hunt with more rain, just soggy. We get in there, get a, a spot dug out in the mud for the, for our tent go to crawl into our sleeping bags and you didn't have a sleeping bag. And I'm thinking, who is this guy? <laughs> what yeah. did I get myself into? <laughs> the funny thing was, the funny thing was, is, you know, I took all the extra layers. Yeah, I lent you everything gear. I could. Yeah. And then you stayed in your bag and I slept fine. Did you? And okay. then, yeah, I actually, it, it actually ended up being fine. And then, uh, which I was really frustrated about because I was, I am an extremely avid all growing up an extremely avid backpacker. Yeah. Yeah. And I think just the, the stress of just trying to get out of work and trying oh, yeah. to do it was Labor yeah, Day we've, weekend. We've all been there with something, trying right? To, yeah. Trying to get up on the mountain. Yeah. I just, and the, my sleeping bag was back at the truck in the stuff sack and everything compressed, compressible stuff sack. It just didn't find a way into my pack, I guess. <laughs> and, but I do remember, uh, I may have been the idiot to forget my bag, but, the next day we endured a lot of rain. Oh man. And, uh, I remember specific, we saw quite a few deer. Yeah. A couple of nice and ones. And I, and I remember specifically wanting to stay, uh, and just deal with it. And you were like, man, let's just bug out. You're going to freeze to death. <laughs> That's right. I think I talked to you, talked to you out of, out yeah. of spending yeah. another night. I, I felt mostly just cause I felt guilty and felt bad for you. Well, and it, it compounded my guilt because I don't know if you remember, but I, I think it was two years later we're, we're going way off on a tangent here, but this is uh, good times. But, um, like at some point I had this realization that all along I had an emergency bivy in my 
emergency kit in my pack. Do you remember yeah, that? It, I came to you like sheepishly. It's like, I, I got to get this off my chest. I yeah. feel terrible because I'm fairly certain that all that entire hunt, I had an emergency bivy in my emergency kit and never even thought about it. It never even occurred it. to me that it's like, I could pull that out and James could actually sleep in this emergency bivy. It's always there. It never leaves my pack. And yeah. uh, anyway, so I felt pretty yeah. bad about that. <laughs> I remember you telling me about that. Anyway, that oh. was, that was, that was, that was quite the time yeah. I've, I've really never, never again in the countless numbers of hunts that I've done since then. I've never again for, I've never again forgotten anything near that <laughs> important before. Yeah. So yeah, you learn kind of a one-time deal. And <laughs> I've been, man, I was, I was leading backpacking trips with my friends starting at like 15 years old without parental super i mean we'd go oh, up yeah. in the winters yeah. for a for a week monday to monday to saturday and yeah. i put together these trip itineraries to convince the other parents to let their boys come nice. and at 15 i was leading these expeditions so i i'm, I'm no stranger to backpacking i uh, grew up rifle hunting with my dad and grandpa in both utah and wyoming yeah. but it was more just truck hunting um we do little day hikes from a you know a truck based camp um and then that, when I decided enough was enough with the Utah pumpkin patch, mm. kind of had that finger injury from climbing and, uh, just really needed some other hobby to really get into. And I got that first bow and man, head over hills doesn't begin to describe what I've done <laughs> since then at archery. Yeah. Yeah. So. Well, I, I think, you know, and, and we didn't uh, do you an official introduction, but I think we have probably given enough kind of background backstory there. You know, uh, the the approach today is, is I think you have a very unique, um, you're in a unique position where uh, you've, your trajectory in the archery hunting space has taken off dramatically, right? I mean, you know, hockey puck kind of thing. Uh, you've done been very, very successful over the last several years, um, archery hunting all over the West. And, um, you know, we kind of got our start together. I'll be the first to admit, I, I am still a novice archer. You know, I, I've archery hunted since then on and off, but, uh, especially with joining gun works that kind of comes with the territory, you know, I've kind of focused, uh, most of my efforts, uh, in those years since on the, on the rifle hunting side of things. Um, finally just uh, ordered a new bow replacing the one that I, I picked up yeah. that year in 2012 when we met. So it, I was long overdue. Uh, I can't wait for my new bow this year and uh, kind of dive back into it. But I thought that, you know, with our background and our history and kind of the two vastly different trajectories we've taken, one focusing on archery, one focusing on rifle, um, over the last years, I, I, I just, I think there's kind of some cool, um, parallels and kind of discussion to be had there, whether it's diving into the, the old ethical debates with, uh, rifle versus archery versus long range and whatever else, um, or just kind of some of the techie parallels and differences there. I think there's just kind of some fun, fun, uh, nuances there to, there to explore. But yeah, uh, you for know, sure. I think you and I, think very differently. You're an engineer. I'm not, although I did spend a couple of years pretending to be an engineering student <laughs> in college. <laughs> so I think we're, we're both wired very similarly, very gear oriented, very detail oriented. Um, you know, it, it'll, uh, we've probably butted heads a little bit over, over the years, like any, uh, uh, good hunting buddies have, uh, probably know and have. Um, but yeah, I don't know where, where do we, where do we dive in there? We took a few notes here. Um, but I mean, maybe give us just a little bit of background on where archery has taken you the last couple of years. Um, and then, and then I think the, the roundabout there is that you're diving more into the, the rifle hunting. You always have, you never gave up rifle hunting, uh, but kind of maybe, uh, coming full circle on the rifle thing as well. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So my, like I said, I've rifle hunted my whole life. Um, the very first deer I killed was in Wyoming with my dad and grandpa. Uh, you could hunt at Wyoming starting at 12 mm. versus Utah at the time was 14. Drew Wyoming every year we could, um, hunted Utah. I didn't hunt my senior year in high school. Uh, I was captain of the wrestling team. Um, 
And then I went on a, an LDS mission for two years when I was 19, uh, 19 through 21. Didn't hunt, obviously, those years, but pretty much every year but those three I've, I've hunted, um, mostly rifle hunting growing up, well, exclusively rifle hunting growing up. Yeah. Um, met my wife um, my senior year in college. Um, uh, our first couple of years of marriage, we traveled the world rock climbing, and we were very competitive rock climbers. And I sustained a, an injury in my in my left hand. I pulled a kind of rough, partially ruptured a tendon, and I'm the sort of person that if I'm not physically engaged in something, if I don't have like something to direct all of my focus, I can I can get anxious and depressed. Mm-hmm. Um, so my wife was seeing this come on because I couldn't I couldn't climb, and she her her dad is a big bow hunter. Uh, he lives in the White Mountains of Arizona. Has killed like five bulls over three fifty. One of them was approaching four hundred. Um, mostly archery. I think that big one did happen to be a rifle bull. But anyway, uh, she was like, you know, my dad really is into archery. He loves all the practicing. I think you should get into it. So that was the spring of 2013. One thing that people should know about me is, uh, like you had said, I'm an engineer, I'm a consulting engineer. I design and help refineries meet uh, mission standards um, set by the EPA. So I design uh, uh, production equipment with an most a big focus on uh, emissions uh, lowering emissions and, 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 and meeting that sort of thing. Gotcha. Um, pretty good, pretty good at what I do. Um, I have a very detail oriented mind, um, uh, pretty OCD, anal retentive, whatever you want to call it. Mm. Anyway, so that, that always ends up translating into whatever main hobby I'm doing at the time. And in my life, it's kind of just been a few things, mountain biking, rock climbing, and, and now, and now, archery hunting, I, 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 I'd say, but, uh, so the interesting thing about the archery. So in 2013, we went on our first hunt, um, together, uh, ended up getting my butt kicked, just a steep learning curve. Um, the first couple of months of that season. And then in October, I was able to kill a bull in one of the, uh, extended archery units in Utah. Uh, just a little five point with a buddy of mine. Um, and it, and it kind of just changed my world. It was like a 60 yard shot. Uh, it was quartered away. I hit him a little far back. Um, but, uh, he was quartered hard enough that it got up inside the goods. The bull died really quick and, um, it just blew my mind. Yeah. Uh, here I, that's actually the very first time 2013 was the very first time I'd elk hunted, never elk hunted growing up with my dad. We did an occasional antelope hunt and it was always deer. Yeah. And then, uh, later that fall, uh, this is 2013 still, um, again, in one of the extended units, I was able to take a nice three point buck, uh, pretty tall. And my first year bow hunting killed a buck and bull in my home state of Utah. And I was just captivated by the sport. Um, 2014, um, comes around and I'm already, I'm already learning voraciously reading as much as I can. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I, I, I'm now I'm, I'm kind of over the KSL bow that I had bought. I'm going to an archery shop, getting the latest and greatest bow set up with the best site. And, 2014 i'm going out thinking i'm gonna crush it like i did in 13 uh went on a uh limited entry hunt with my buddy jaron he had a bull tag um i had i was just captivated by elk elk hunting at that point because that first great experience um long it was a a long four or five five or six days actually i think on day six finally was able to call a bull in and uh, my buddy Jaron arrowed a nice bull at like 12 yards that I called right past and was like 350-ish, just below 350, I think. We call him 350. And uh, Colin, that, that experience was just phenomenal, having a limited entry experience like that, calling a bull in close. And then uh, 
I had an archery elk tag and deer tag in Utah that year as well. Um, had a rifle tag in Wyoming. Um, ended up not filling either tag in Utah and I killed like a small two by three in Wyoming that year. Um, uh, mostly just a jerky buck. I tend to make jerky out all my, yeah. all my deer. And, um, so that was the close of 2014. And, and at that point I was, I was it, this was the sport. So I, yeah. at that point I basically sold, I think from four, 2014 to 2015, um, by 14, I'd kind of healed a little bit from the climbing and, um, uh, was really starting to, I, I was, I was climbing some, but in 2014 to 15, I think I started selling off my climbing equipment yeah. and started picking up going all in. archery, yeah. going all in on archery. Yeah. And I think in, in parallel, um, if I remember right, 2014 was a year I drew that mountain goat tag in Utah and I'd been yep. kind of watching this gun work stuff for, for so long and drooling over it. I finally uh, made the plunge and picked up a six, five, two eighty four and taught myself how to reload on the fly. And, you know, basically went, you know, I was shooting steel a thousand yards by, by the end of that season and ended up killing a mountain goat in Utah, 830 yards or something like that. Um, and so kind of we're, we're both, we were still at that point, we were hunting together. Uh, you yep. know, I think we, we hunted Wyoming that year, right? That was our, the first year I had a Fif Wyoming tag. It was 15. Fif Fif yeah. 15, yeah. So anyway, I'm, you know, kind of, kind of took a little bit different trajectories there, but, um, both geeking out and kind of going all in on the, um, in our different disciplines, I guess one might say. Yeah. And I remember specific, I remember talking to you about the, the long range rifle stuff. And it just kind of blew in my mind because you and I, I just figured we were very similar and very similar walks of life. And I, yeah. I didn't know how attainable that really was. You know, I thought that it was only sniper ex snipers in the military that right. were shooting out right. beyond like I mean, 500 yards. You right? know, it's amazing how much the uh, sport has progressed even in the last five or eight years. Um, but even then, and, and even still now, if you don't know what you, you, if you don't know what you don't know, it's a black box until you kind of get familiarized with it. And then it's, you know, you can go deep, as deep as you want, but the, on the surface level, it's really not that complicated once you know what you're, what you're doing. You yeah, know? correct. And it was a big black box for me all growing up, you know, 300 yards was a really long shot yeah. deer hunting. Um, you know, we killed a couple of decent four points, you know, 140, 150 inch four points all growing up. And my dad has a couple of bigger bucks, um, that he was taking, but nothing truly giant. Um, and then in 2015, um, you know, we, we, uh, we drew, we drew our Wyoming tags together. Um, no, you were a resident by then, weren't you in 15 or were you not? No, no, that was, I think that was the last year we hunted Wyoming there. As non-residents, so yeah, yeah. As as non-residents, so yeah, we both drew, we both drew the tags. Um, our buddy Chris and our buddy Scott also drew. Yeah, and uh, that year, like I said, I at this point I'd gone all in, and when I say all in, that is my life at this point. Yeah. I'm married, I don't have kids, and I had an extremely voracious appetite. I remember going up to the archery shop and talking to them about concepts you know, maybe their, their head bow tech completely knew and understood, but sometimes you're not always dealing with the head bow tech. And yeah. I was talking to some of these younger kids who have been bow techs for a while, but I was talking about things that were kind of just going over their head. And, um, so I ended up, uh, ended up doing, you know, started tinkering a lot with my own equipment starting as early as 2015 and 16. And then that, um, that August, I killed what I what I figure is my first real big deer, um, uh, 180 class, 35 inch wide, three by four on a general tag, yeah. general archery tag, and uh, just a tremendous experience. Got some help from some guys that I'd met up on the mountain, uh, um, and 
a guy named Mason and, and Sinjin, I remember we were uh, kind of going after the same buck and kind of drew straws and the events shuffled throughout the day who was in better position. So we each took kind of turns stalking and then ended up, uh, I ended up covering an escape route and the deer came right up to me and, uh, and I pounded him at 60 yards. And that was, you know, a really big, a humongous deer at the time for me. My oh, yeah. kind of grew up hunting in the shadow of my grandpa and he, he was very much of the time period that width is all that matters. Yeah. Yeah. That old uh, 32 inches wide, right? That's the, the benchmark every, we, we all grew yeah. up looking for. You don't, yeah. you don't even, you don't even think about anything else. All those, apparently there were hunting competitions where they had these box measures that mm-hmm. it was just outside spread. That's all that matters. Yeah. My grandpa, he's passed, um, but he, he never killed a 30 incher. He's got, he's got like a 29 and a quarter incher. Um, and he was still alive when I killed that, that buck. And he, he was 34 and five eights. I rounded up to 35, I guess. So I'm just <laughs> generally talking, but, yeah. uh, um, anyway, uh, that deer had him, you know, had the taxidermy done by a local guy here and he had a shop at the, he had a booth at the Western hunt expo. And I, one of the most prideful images that I have in my mind is a picture of me, my dad and my grandpa who I grew up hunting in Wyoming with. He was in a wheelchair at the time at the expo. We've got a picture of me and, and the, and those, uh, those two others. And that, that's just a picture that will never leave my mind. And that's good memories right there. That's pretty cool. So, and then we went on our Wyoming hunt and, uh, um, we went up archery hunting and I think we had a, a horse accident early. You yeah. and Chris went home early. Yeah, that's right. Scott and I stayed up. Um, I had a shot opportunity. Uh, uh, the deer was aware of me. It was like a 60 yard shot and, you know, jumped in the string. Um, and I think later we ended up just going up on various rifle hunting trips. Yeah. A couple back and forth trips and whenever people could. Yeah. Yeah. And just, just different pairs of the group. And, um, you, you killed, I believe. Killed my first Wyoming buck. Still one of my favorites. I always wanted a buck with some trash and he was a a giant three point with, uh, with some extras. So not a real fantastic scoring buck, but pretty dang happy with that deer. And then I, yeah, I killed my first buck with some, with an inline, uh, two inlines, actually. One of them was four or five inches. Uh, I think Scott killed yeah, as yeah. well. And I, I, I don't think Chris, I think Chris was the only one in the group that didn't kill he that passed, deer. He passed on the deer that I killed to give him credit. He found it and I killed it because he didn't, he, yeah. it wasn't wide enough for him. <laughs> it wasn't wide enough. Yeah. Yeah. He did have an opportunity on our last hunt. Um, uh, well, we all really had plenty buck. of opportunities, right? We're passing on a lot of deer as well, but yeah. 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 And he, he took a shot, I think our second to last day at a really big buck, probably approaching 180. Yeah. Um, and, and just missed as the deer was running through the trees. I remember hearing a couple of shots and, um, yeah, so that was kind of our 2015 hunt. I, I killed a nice bull, a six point on the extended archery hunt that year and in utah and that with the the wyoming hunt was just a fantastic year so yeah and it's just been been uh, gangbusters ever since you've killed some ab- absolute monsters you killed probably the one of the best deer i saw come from a diy archer this year anywhere in the west um i mean a lot of people probably saw this deer floating around the interwebs over the last, or I guess that wasn't last year. We're February now. It was the year before last, right? Yeah. Yeah. So it's 2020. Yeah. yeah. Big archery buck on the extended. Um, and uh, 2019, I killed another really big one, big three by four. Yeah. Um, all really wide. And, and uh, you know, I do as much archery hunting, killed a couple of nice bulls, big mature bulls with the bow in Idaho. Um, uh, Wyoming, um, Arizona killed a couple of bucks and bucks on their OTC hunt, mm-hmm. killed a nice, killed a five point, um, on, 
on a hunt there in uh, was one of those November general easy to draw general archery hunts in November. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of been you and I and Chris actually have done a tremendous amount of out of state hunting um, without having to acquire a lot of points. So we've kind of found our little yeah our little units and our little niche of you know this OTC you know OTC slash Couple very points. easy to draw. Yeah units and uh you know we've got we've got our we've got our hunt planned this fall yeah. it's the 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 same yep. the three of us are bringing the gang back together and, and going on a and rifle it's hunt. been a couple of years since the three of us actually hunted uh, together uh, all at once so yep. looking forward to that one for sure yeah that'll that'll be a good hunt um so yeah yeah we got here are what's that I was I was just gonna say uh, so we both go down this you go head over hills into long range hunting by this point you know we kind of talked about 2015 and some of the following years I almost went exclusively archery hunting until 2019 yeah if I you know in Wyoming I consider Wyoming a little bit different because if you draw the tag in Wyoming you can hunt all three seasons right. Yeah. So, you know, when we did our second hunt in Wyoming together was the, the, the elk hunt we went on. Mm-hmm. Um, we didn't fill the archery tag. So we went back up with the rifles. I whacked a spike and you killed a, like a five point or yeah. something. Yeah. And then the next year we drew our deer tags again. Mm-hmm. I, again, I focused on archery. You and Chris came up for a few days over Labor Day. Um, I missed a buck on that hunt, um, kind of a tough hunt. And then again, we kind of just as we could went up on the archery or on the rifle hunt. And I think we, we ended up filling, filling our tags in different areas on different trips on that rifle hunt. Yeah. So we were hunting Wyoming quite a bit. Um, and I kind of drew those tags with the mentality, me personally of archery hunting, but with the rifle as an option, I wasn't not going to go try to fill the tag. Uh, but everything else I was doing at the time was really was really archery focused. Yeah. And then uh, by now, by 2016, I had purchased pretty much every piece of archery equipment, 16 to 17, and just started exclusively tuning my own equipment, cutting my own arrows, doing everything in my garage. Right. Yeah. I just felt like I was doing a better job. I knew more about it than... I'm just so meticulous. I'd have to pay somebody a thousand dollars to set my bow up the way I'd want to. Right, right. And, and and so I just I just knew the way I wanted to do it. How I wanted my peak tied. How I want my D loop tied. How I want my bow to tune and where I want my center shot to be placed and how I want my cam tied. I can go on. I could write a book about it. But then the the funny thing was, is I started having kids. Um, yeah. 2018 and I'm uh, you know I'm doing three out of state hunts a year with my two tags here in Utah and 2018 I'd spread myself so thin mm-hmm. I killed three general OTC bulls in three states I killed an arch those were all archery Utah it was Idaho Utah and Arizona killed a a really nice really corkscrewy buck in Idaho um, that was a rifle hunt again, follow up. I intended to archery hunt. Um, uh, didn't get, didn't fill anything on the archery hunt. That deer hunt went back up for a couple of days on the rifle, filled that. And then I killed a buck that year in 2018. Uh, we had our first kid and that year stretched me so thin. I mean, I was, I was. Kids change things. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No doubt and about I was it. on three out of state hunts where there were like 10 to 10 days to two weeks long. And it just, so in 2019, you know, as we're putting in for draws, I was talking with Chris, he had, he and I had very similar points and I just kind of come to this realization that with the kids and my job getting more intense that I can't plan 10 days to two weeks for every single out of state hunt. If I'm going to continue to, you know, I, I really love the adventure of out of state hunting and hunting in new places. And I, I, my dad bred that in me. You know, we, we, I killed my first deer as a non-resident. Yeah. Um, so where we 
starting to come first full circle. So from 15 to 18, I did very little rifle hunting, just kind of whimsical follow-up type hunts, but never, never was really the plan, never was the focus. And then 19, I was like, you know, if I'm going to, if I'm going to do these out of state hunts and, and, uh, appease my wife and my kids, I need to, I need to change something. Our buddy Chris and I had the same number of points in in Colorado. Yeah. So that was the first year that I put in for a rifle tag in three or four years with the intent. No, actually, since since 2012, so six seven years. Where you're intending intent, on a intending focused rifle hunt. Yeah. A focused rifle hunt. Yeah. And by this point, I had kind of already learned that I am an extremely meticulous hunter. I expect the best out of my bow. I shoot daily. Um, I spend a lot of money for archery. I'm a member of the Easton club here. Um, I'm a member of the beehive Wasatch bow hunters club. So I'm just shooting my bow a tremendous amount. And I wasn't really satisfied with, you know, off the shelf options with the rifle anymore. Yeah. And I'm sitting here talking to Chris and Chris had kind of pieced together a rifle with you. I'm saying, you know, you and I have always talked a lot and I'm talking to you about it. And I'm just like, man, how, how am I going to get into a nice rifle without dedicate the kind of time that you put into your archery setup? Archery. Correct. And I'm just like, I'm trying to go to rifle hunting to kind of save some time. So how, how do I do this? Well, in comes Gunworks, and not just buying a Gunworks rifle, but buying into the Gunworks system. Yeah, and that was that was something that you did a very good job of explaining to me. You know, and and funny not to cut you off, but you know, not everybody's a, a Gunworks rifle customer, and and we're not shy about that, right? Um, you know, some of us prefer to tinker and DIY everything and piece it together and figure out a load. Some of us are time is money and we don't have a lot of the time to, to set something up. And so I always saw you as more of a DIYer. It's kind of the pedigree that both of us have kind of come through. But at some point, you only have so much bandwidth and so much time and so many priorities that can fall to the, come to the top of your list. And for you, archery, your focus on archery was stays the priority but you want to be able to um perform at a top level with with a rifle system and i think that's exactly where where we come in yeah exactly that's you i I couldn't have said it any better myself my bandwidth my extra bandwidth i should say was zero yeah you know i it is still at the time i was convinced that you had to be tinkering with your rifle and you had to get out uh, and shoot just a crazy amount in order to make that 800 plus yard shot. And at this point, you know, you and I are engaging in talks weekly and I've got this Colorado hunt that we know we're going to draw. Mm-hmm. Um, but we ended up spending like seven points on a three point unit yeah. just because we had some intel. And I didn't apply unit. that year cause I didn't have enough points and turned out I would have, yeah, you, yeah. yeah you would have had enough points. Yeah. yeah. Um, um, Anyway, so we, we did it. We, uh, you convinced me. I remember thinking that I was going to go 300 caliber cause I was just always 30 out six, 300 yeah. women kind of guy. And, uh, you help, you help, uh, bring me back to uh, a more comfortable seven millimeter 28. Yeah. And, uh, we debated on 28 versus seven rem mag and ended up decided going seven rem mag and man, that's when my mind exploded. I got that rifle in my hands and we, we kind of joke that, uh, that was the best rifle Gunworks ever produced, oh, dude. but man, that thing. Yeah. I mean, we produce every rifle we produce is freaking phenomenal, right? I mean, it, it's not going to leave our doors if, it, if it's not just top, top notch, but every once in a while you run into a unicorn among unicorns and, and that one you know, I ended up shooting that rifle and doing this, some, some tuning and scope mounting for you. And the, you could not miss with that thing. It was, yeah, yeah. It, it was to the point where I, I seriously considered uh, building another one and <laughs> keeping <you know? laughs> Get, yeah. getting another one for you. But yeah, that's, you got yeah. a u- unicorn among unicorns right there. That's a, that's yeah. a true one hole. And we gun. did it. 
we did uh yeah it definitely was a one hole gun um and we did it we did it it's honestly we you know i called you up and we worked out a build that was in my my price range yeah. and we we kind of did it as cheaply as we could yeah. still went with the carbon stock yeah went with the magnus yeah we went you with ended the, up steel uh, steel action right so a little heavier steel action yeah steel barrel uh, too we when we were still building steel, steel barrels yeah correct yeah steel barrel um little longer barrel um and man we we put together the right recipe on that hunt and i've and i've I've yet to miss in the field with that gun. In fact, everything's been one shot, one shot kills. Yeah. Uh, ended up killing a mid 170 buck with a five inch cheater on that Colorado hunt. Chris ended up killing a banger mid 180s. Really uh, nice deer. Just bomber yeah. heavy, typical. I think it's the biggest deer he's killed. Um, and that was, uh, that was 2019 second season rifle hunt in Colorado. And, that was Chris on his horses, and again, that was that was a ten. That was you know an eight day. So Saturday to the following Sunday, we got there a day or two early, and that was very much backpack oriented. Exactly how we've been archery hunting, yeah. You know, a week long hunt, and we just figured it out. Like you kind of have to figure out early season rifle hunting, or sorry, early season archery hunting, or 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 what have you. And my, it blew my mind. I was like, you can do a 10 day rifle hunt and make it, you know, technical and intense and you can make it the adventure that yeah, this isn't rolling around with a side by side. And, you know, like all the, all the uh, archery hunters want to think that what rifle the, hunting the, is, right? Yeah. So <laughs> it blew my mind. And, and yeah. like I said, I, you know, I hadn't given up rifle hunting. I just, we kind of just talked about all the experiences in Wyoming and uh, where I was kind of going up and it was kind of, it was kind of the, wasn't the focus, but, but yeah. you know, I was still rifle hunting, but it, you know, it was like weekend type stuff, Yeah. but this was a dedicated, you know, eight, nine day hunt and it blew my mind. It, it was, it was so much fun because at this point I've archery, been archery hunting for six years uh, I've had a lot of success, but I've also got my butt kicked on a lot of archery hunts. So it was a really nice change of pace. And basically ever, ever since then, you know, it's been three, it's been two or three seasons now since then. And I've just told myself that I want to do, I want to dedicate, you know, one or two rifle hunts every year for one time savings. Um, Cause I don't think, uh, I think you can go out and get it done a little bit faster with the rifle than you can with, with the bow. Um, that being said, uh, one of the th things that I know we wanted to touch on in 2020, my rifle hunt that year, uh, I drew a four point tag in Arizona. It was a November rifle deer hunt in an area. I know that I've got friends who live down there. I've got family, my whole wife's family's from similar area. And I went down there expecting to kill a giant because I knew there were some walking around that year. Yeah. The stars didn't align. It was 80 degrees in November. It was a full moon. I was hunting PJ country. And I'm on record saying, you know, this is an archery guy saying that the the hardest hunt that I've ever done was that hunt. And it was a heavily roaded, yep. I road hunted for six days, rifle hunt. Late season. Yeah. And, yeah. No, and November, no, November for them is kind of like an October hunt True. elsewhere. True. Yeah. So it's not, it's not the rut. It definitely was not the rut. Um, uh, this is, this was south of the big ditch. So yeah. those deer, you know, the desert deer rut later. Anyway, that hunt kicked my butt, didn't fill the tag and holy smokes. I just remember how mentally draining, like I woke up fearing my glass because it was just, I was so low, <laughs> not very much reception. 12 hours behind unit, glass. Yeah. 12 hours behind the glass by myself. And I just wanted to cry yeah. when that hunt, when that sun set that last day, I was just screw this. Like, <laughs> so I think yeah. a lot of things, you know, archers get the benefit in that their seasons are just freaking fantastic. You know, you're early, you know, you're limited to, you know, a really long shot bow hunting is a hundred yards. Yeah. So ideally you're much less than that. Um, and it, it's re it's not that difficult getting inside a couple hundred yards on a deer, but man, getting inside that, 
you know, ideally 60 and under, that's really hard. Yeah. And, but you, but you're going out there, you're seeing animals, you're seeing big animals. Um, you're either hunting early season when the temperatures are great, the weather is nice, or you're hunting the rut. Yeah. And one thing that I've just always felt was really badass were these guys who could do, who could do it all, right? They could go, they could go out and they can go kill a buck in a, in a physically grinding hunt in the Colorado high country, but then they could turn around and they can find that ear flicker in the PJ country in October and kill a stud hard horn buck in, in October. Right. And, and I've always valued that cause I have a strong background in rifle hunting and, and, uh, and so that's where, you know, I, I, I consider myself now more than ever more weapons agnostic. Um, I'm chasing I opportunity will, and, yeah, and chase, trophy, right? Yeah. Uh, with yeah, whatever it takes to get it done. Yeah, correct. And I think there are, are little loops, you know, there, I think, I think that we're setting ourselves up for a great opportunity to kill some banger bucks in Idaho this year. Yeah. The research hopefully. that we've done, the units that we've picked, how the weather's played out the last few years yeah. with this, this perpetual La Nina that we've been having. I think we're, we're poisoned. That's a rifle hunt, right? I, um, I've killed all my biggest animals, all of them have been both deer and elk have been archery. Um, killed some nice mud. I've, I've dabbled, started dabbling the last couple of years in, in muzzleloader hunts, yeah. open site muzzleloader hunting. And, and I'm chasing, I'm chasing the best opportunity. I think my home state in Utah will pretty much forever be my, you know, almost exclusively an archery focus. I say that and I just killed a, a really nice bull on the, the general rifle hunt here with my rifle, but. which is a feat in and of itself. Um, yeah. Anybody that knows general elk hunting in Utah, it's not really a thing for a reason. <laughs> yeah, cor yeah, correct. There's 20, 20,000 plus tags in at a geographically in absolutely tiny, tiny yeah. area. And finding any bull is, is phenomenal on those hunts for sure. Yeah. He did pretty well there. So, I mean, you know, I think that that tech versus tradition, I think, is kind of an interesting angle. And, you know, obviously archery has gone as far, if not farther down that tech road than rifle hunting it has in, in previous years. You know, I think you see the year over year progress in archery, I think, is probably outpacing uh, the general rifle market. And, you know, maybe I'm you know, that's not a numbers driven thing, but it, you see s such dramatic improvements over the last 10 years in archery equipment. Uh, I don't think that you've seen that quite as dramatically in the rifle side of things. Um, you know, we've been shooting bolt action rifles for over a hundred years and they seem to be correct. <laughs> seem to be working pretty well, but yeah, I, I did definitely agree with that comment. Um, I'm a big believer in, so I want to hunt, you know, we, we, we just talked about this that you know you and I and Chris are we're, we're OT you know OTC or easy to draw yeah. easy to draw type hunters. Um, so I like hunting. I like hunting multiple states. I love the adventure. That being said, I also like my technology, right? Like once I once I once I got behind my first Gunworks rifle, which we didn't throw the belt, you know, we didn't throw the kitchen sink at. It's it's it, it's a it's a steel barrel gun. It's the first gen action. Um, about the fanciest thing on that gun was, uh, the carbon stock, but it still was precision made. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm buying gunworks ammunition and that thing irrelevant of the box of ammo that I'm buying from you because perpetually year after year after year, you're keeping your loads consistent yeah. and that gun just continues to shoot. And with me being so archery focused, you know, I tinker. Um, so I, so I, I'm, I, I've started writing for Western Hunter magazine specifically mm -hmm. in the archery space. Right. And people are getting a little bit bigger idea of, of how much I tinker with my bow. Right. I spend a tremendous amount of time on my bow and then I'm in the field a tremendous amount of time. I exercise a lot. I've got two boys, an extremely demanding job. I do not have the time to tinker with my rifle right. like I do with my bow, but I expect the same precision. Hence the gun works system. Right, right. Um, I really like, so I, so like I said, the, ch the seasons are challenging. I like technology. I like that 
I, I like that I can, you know, that Colorado buck, I took it almost 900 yards, dropped in cold, um, killed that really nice bull on the, the general Utah hunt this year. Um, if he wasn't broken, he, he would have been a monster. Yeah. Um, he, he, that was a 600 yard shot. I killed an odd ad, um, at, at about 600 yards too. So I, I mean, I've, I've taken some pokes with that rifle and all the animals just drop. Yeah. Um, it's been good shot placement that the animals, uh, 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 I practice, you know, I shoot my rifle quite a bit. I probably in since 2019, I've probably put six, 700 rounds through that gun. Yeah. Um, uh, but just the confidence behind it, like you were saying is, 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 is really important. Now the, the tech versus tradition, this is very interesting because obviously at the current trajectory, you know, if we, if we, if we're becoming more successful as hunters because of the tech, something's got to give, right? You can't just, we have a finite number of animals and I've kind of had my own view on this, like, solution you know this is me personally you and i have talked about it i think the solution is is kind of limiting tags in these in these in the in the techs in the tech tags yeah we've we've gotten too too good at at killing things right i mean everybody you you see all these headlines that hunter recruitment is down and that very well may be true but at the same time i think the hunters that are out there are getting more serious about it they're doing you're seeing massive um swings in uh uh what it takes to drop a tag in in yeah. in uh multiple states and so uh, you got a lot of people doing out of state hunts where they weren't were staying at home in the past so we've just become way better at killing stuff archers it used to be you know you're probably planning on a 10 or 20 percent success rate on archery hunters and they're killing the first two points they're finding that is not the case anymore Uh, the art uh, you you know the last few hunt years i hunted in utah i think all the archers were killing the vast majority of the big bucks out of the units i was hunting before the rifle hunt even started and i was seeing more archery hunters out in the field than i was seeing rifle hunters you know we talk about the old pumpkin patch it was kind of turned on its head so i i think you know this is probably a, a whole can of worms to to dive into on another day but I, I think you're right i think it's it's starting to look at these um well we, it, it's just not sustainable right we, we have to at some point limit our take from from the pool and my perspective on that and i think we're on the same boat is limiting the high tech i i, I i'm not, i do not support outlying the tech but I think what we're going to find is these rifle tags, these comp, even compound archery tags might become very, very limited in their quotas and allocations. And to maintain the opportunity that all these um, game and fish uh, organizations always talk about, I think you have to shift the majority of these tags into black powder primitive hunts into maybe a, a traditional archery hunt rather than a compound archery hunt maybe comp, you know a, a, a open class bow or whatever you want to call that becomes a limited limited draw tag it's a difficult tag to come by just like a, a rifle tag is you know yeah exactly so i i share the same opinion i like technology um you know i i think some of the wildlife ag- agencies are starting to form committees and they're you know here in utah they're going to evaluate technologies um cameras so trail cameras have been on just, the chopping just block just got banned yeah yeah and i and honestly i didn't i originally didn't put up a big stink about it cuz i thought it was only going to be wireless cameras on the chop but that they were going to put a season on and i was fine with that right yeah they're out there transmitting during the hunt is that fair no probably not um but uh, but then all of a sudden it kind of turned and they they outlawed all cameras, yeah. And you know I I view that as a scouting tool. Yeah. You know if if we're talking about advantages here, who gets to draw the line that the cameras are bad, but spotting scope and binoculars are okay? Yeah. Well, um, I've killed way more animals because of my spotting scope than because of my trail camera. Yeah. But it's a tool nonetheless. My trail camera glasses for me in thick unglassable country right yeah just 
just like my spotting scope without my spotting scope i can't see three miles across the canyon i have no business knowing what's three miles away sure. well i can because of the spotting scope yeah. so how how can somebody say that the spotting scope is ethical but the camera is not like, right right it still takes effort to go put the cameras up and then you get in the whole debate of I know people say that the cameras, you don't have to be present for the cameras to do scouting for you. Okay, so by that mentality, guides should be outlawed because social media. The hunter do, yeah, social media. The, <laughs> yeah. the hunter doesn't have to be present when the guide's out scouting. Like, so yeah. obviously something needs to be done about technology. And then you've got the new technologies and thermal. I like what that Utah recently did with that. They haven't outlawed thermal, they and I and I don't own or use those. Our night vision. Um, they just put a. You can't. You can't use those forty-eight hours before your hunt. I think yeah. that's similar to the flying rules in Utah. Sure, sure. Um, but like I said, I own a Gunworks rifle. I I've shot it well past a thousand yards in practice. I've killed a deer nine hundred yards with it. I have a Garmin sight on my bow. I use cameras. I like technology, but I understand something has to give. And I've kind of always been of the thought want to go hunt yeah i want to go hunt with the you know i've become more weapons agnostic if i need to if archery if you know open class uh archery hunts become harder to draw or open class rifle hunts become harder to draw i'm a big proponent of you know let's limit those tags in these open class archery or rifle hunts during the same seasons but where you cut tags there open up an OTC in all your archery units, open up an OTC longbow or recurve only hunt. Sure. Yeah. Then you get opportunity. If you don't draw your open class bow, it's the same season. So you don't have to structure anything differently. You go pick up an OTC recurve tag. Yeah. Or maybe you don't make it OTC, but where the number of tags that you cut from the open class, maybe you could triple those for the OTC op sure. for the, and the same thing could be said for rifle hunts. Yeah. You have your open class technology rifle hunt that is a hard draw. Maybe you have to wait every five years if you want that tag. But if you want during the same exact season, open sights only. Yeah. What, rifle or muzzle loader. Right, right. And you could issue a lot more tags because you're you're really limiting the effectiveness of the hunter by removing that technology. But my biggest thing is technologies as they come up should be evaluated yes but i have a hard time now eliminating technologies that have been in the industry for 20 plus years right yeah that's where if people have gotten used to running cameras or you know running rain like what's the efficacy of uh of of range finders you know what i mean like you want to hurt every if you really want to hurt well then then at that point you're open a can of worms because then you got you know, moral dilemma of not knowing how far your target is, but yeah. you want to hit, you really want to hit people where it hurts. In terms no range of hunting. finders. <laughs> no range finders. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You could limit optics. You know, I, I, I don't know, but. Yeah. Well, I mean, we're diving into the, um, the, the classic ethics debate, right? You know, we catch that all the time on long range. Well, that's not ethical to shoot a, a, an elk from 600 yards or whatever else. Um, you know, you and I, before we started recording here, we were drawing some parallels between archery and rifle. And I, I think there's actually some really interesting parallels to be drawn there. You know, we were looking at, I, I've, I've got this theory that a hundred yards in archery almost exactly translates to a thousand yards in, in rifle honey. And you think about it, you've got all these guys kind of a hundred yard is just that easy, nice round number for everybody to, to latch on to conceptually, but it's kind of I, I widely regarded as kind of like that max possible effective range. Like, like that's an extreme shot, but potentially doable for a very, very talented archer in a, in the, in a proper conditions, right? Basically, Conditions very, are... very sim similar to rifle hunting, right? A thousand yards, good winds, the right setup. It's a very, very executable shot. Um, you know, you start talking about, you dive even deeper down that rabbit hole and you start talking about 
the animal's time to react and, and all this different stuff, you know, you hear all the different arguments on people that seem to pick one side of the argument or the other, just because that's the side that they're on and then <laughs> start making their, their arguments, you know, um, and then try to impose their, their reasons, reasons on others. I mean, I'll, I'll be the first to admit that, um, I've had, I've had, I had an elk, I had a raghorn bull in Idaho was completely unaware of me drinking from a stream, head down, drinking from a stream. And he, I've got a video of it. My friend, Jaron from over my shoulder, 45 yard shot, ninja ducks, the arrow, a bull, yeah, a, a bull an elk. elk, not, not a deer, white not, tail, not yeah. a white tail. <sighs> yeah. Crazy. A bull elk. Yeah. Ninja ducked my arrow. Completely missed. Yeah. I, Everyone, um, I've, I've unfortunately lost a bull that, uh, that I hit and it was a 20 yard shot and he yeah. was drinking and he was drinking water. So easy, easy shot. Yeah. Easy, quote unquote, easy shot. Right? right. But then I've also had, you know, I've had a number of dots are very middle of the road. I'd say my average is probably 60 to 70 yards, 55 to 55 to 65. Um, I've taken some longer shots. Um, I don't know if I've missed a shot on an animal beyond 80 yards. Yeah. And I meaning missed or not recovered that animal. Yeah. Um, so crap can happen at any time, right. at any distance. And I think it really just comes down to what is your effective range in a hunting situation, you know, elevated heart rate. And that's going to be a question. That's going to be something that every person individually is going to have to answer. Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, we, we talked about, you know, reaction time, you know, the, the a typical, uh, uh, complaint as well, that, that time, that animal could move in the time that you, between the time you pull a trigger and your bullet gets there. Well, we did did some numbers, you know. So obviously, every um, every rifle, every bullet setup, every velocity, whatever else is going to change that. But on average, most of your hunting rifles, you're about 1.3 seconds time of flight um, to a thousand yards with a with a modern Magnum hunting rifle. Okay, it might be 1.2, it might be 1.4, um, but it's it's right in there. We were looking at the math, and we haven't calculated it exactly, but you're almost exactly that at a at a hundred yards. Um, with a bow. And so Correct. you start thinking about that. It actually translates almost exactly. Okay. You half that to 500 yards where a lot of people tend to draw their arbitrary line in the sand. And now you're looking at 50 yards um, with a bow. And so, you know, thing, it, it definitely goes both ways. And, and my, my observation is people tend, it, it's all sliding scale, right? People draw their, their imaginary line in the sand and my perspective is that people draw those lines based on their known abilities and their experiences in the field, because that's all they have to go off of. And so if you think about it, where, where you see a lot of people drawing that, that number, it's 400 yards, maybe 500 yards. It seems like you see a lot of people putting it and you know, it varies. Some guys are saying 200 and under some guys are saying seven, 600 or 800 or whatever, but it almost always correlates with their experience and their abilities and what they've seen and done because Correct. it's hard it, it's hard to conceptualize things that you don't understand yeah agreed um and that's where my perspective all growing up when you know when we first met and you had kind of jumped into the long range stuff and i wasn't uh i wasn't quite there i thought that you know long range shooting was just voodoo magic and meant for yeah. ex-military sniper guys and here right. a buddy of mine was out here, you know, trying to figure this thing out on his own and kills a mountain goat beyond 800 yards. And <laughs> I've really come to realize the, that if, if, uh, if you buy the right equipment, if you spend the time that you need to now, you know, that's, what's so cool about Gunworks. And we, we, we kind of talked about my history with Gunworks. Well, this year we're, you know, I'm taking a, I'm taking another step into, I, I'm, I'm ready to, to kind of add another long range gun, if you will, to my, to my, my gun safe and, 
and uh, we just finished building and I just picked up the other day um, yeah. uh, uh, my new uh, 65 PRC from Gunworks and going to yeah. be doing the a series of, of articles in Western Hunter on my experience with the Gunworks system, yeah, and c- kind of relating it to the uh, my time, my bandwidth. That uh, this is the best option for me because my focus is uh, archery. You know, my family, uh, my work. Um, I have a heavy focus on tinkering my archery stuff, but I still expect ultimate precision from my rifle and. Yeah. I'm really excited. Unfortunately, I was sick earlier this week, and yeah, we were I supposed been able to catch to shoot up. the rifle yet. Yeah, yeah, we were supposed to catch up down at the Salt Lake show and record in person, but uh, we're getting to test out our new new setup here instead. So <laughs> yeah, so I'm excited yeah. to get out and shoot that gun and and take it on our on our Idaho hunt this year, and it'll it'll just be great. It's it's more of a mountain light rifle build. Um, I kind of view it as my you know, mountain light rifle. Uh, it's a climber stock, six five PRC, a little shorter barrel. I've yeah. got uh, tax stamp uh, application submitted for a uh, for a uh, suppressor. The, the, yeah. the six inch suppressor from Gunworks. Um, got a Leopold Mark V on it. Um, really kick a scope for the weight. Yeah. Uh, three 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 and a half to eighteen. Three point six to eighteen. Um, Did you throw that uh, rifle on a scale? When you got it. I, I haven't yet. I, like I said, I just picked it up yesterday. Yeah. So. Should should be under eight pounds. I think, especially with that new barrel profile that we just developed for from the our last Skunk Works project. I think those are coming in under eight pounds now. So, pretty nice, yeah. light, light little yeah. build. Yeah, it's 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 sweet. I'm I'm really excited to go put a few down range with it and and hunt with it this fall. Yeah. Well, looking forward to October for sure. We'll have to get together and do some shooting might might need to get you up to a shooting school this summer too. get you kind of tuned up yeah for sure it'd be great well is there anything we didn't cover um pretty much got our whole life story and of hunts in the in the mix here and we'll have a few more to catch up on after the end of the season here but yeah i'm really looking forward to those western hunter articles um obviously you know you did a fantastic job on on your archery articles which has been your focus. So I'm, I'm definitely excited to see how some of that approach translates into the, into the rifle world. for Yeah. You. So, and a lot of it, you know, so the, the interesting thing is, you know, why is, why is the archery guru Western hunter writing these? But when, you know, when we talked to, when we talked about this series that we were going to do, that was the idea that yeah. the gunworks isn't actually out there, you know, gunworks, has their niche and their niche is guys like me that that maybe right the the rifle isn't their one isn't their focus 100 percent and they need but they expect precision in it like other aspects of their life and like we talked about before i i don't have to worry at that that seven millimeter that i've had for the last few years i've got that that gun just bleeds i just bleed confidence with that gun in my hands yeah and that is, it is crazy for me to think that I haven't developed a load. I shoot it quite a bit, but you know, when I run out of ammo, I can, I can get online, I can order new ammo and it comes and that thing just still shoots. Yeah. And it's crazy for me to think how much confidence I have in that gun, but honestly, how, how little time that I have to spend on the technical side of things, because when I decided on the gun works, instead of just a custom rifle build, I'm buying into the system, yeah. not, not, uh, not just a, a fancy rifle in of itself. Right. Right. Well, and the other thing to think about is like you mentioned, you shoot it quite a bit that not having to tinker with all that other stuff leaves time for you to shoot you it. Shoot. Correct. Right. To come, to come up and take a class and, and learn to read wind with it. You know, all these different things that, that are going to make you a more successful hunter with, I mean, you obviously are putting the time in, but you're focusing that time on the things that really matter. Matter. This Somebody yeah. else like Gunworks can do the reloading, can do yeah. the, can do the design, you know? Yeah. I'm the one pulling the trigger at the end and how my trigger control, how I, how I manage that recoil, 
you know, that's all on me, right? That's that's yeah. in the moment on me. So that's that's where I'm putting my practice in, and I I'm saving the time on uh, I'm I'm saving the time on the reloading and which knowing me, if I were to get into the reloading, oh my word, I think it would it would inundate me with details. I, I, that I think I think we've discussed that, and I and I see your uh, little RCBS charge master sitting on the. On the desk yeah. behind you there, so that's for my. Hopefully, we'll get you book. down that rabbit hole pretty quick. <laughs> I think, and, I, and I'm not saying it would never happen, because uh, it yeah. probably will. But I've got a three year old and a five year old, yeah. and the next few years, you know, just a lot of demands on me. Um, but you know, five ten years from now, yeah, I probably will be reloading. But yeah, at least right now in my life, I'm I'm pretty content with the confidence that I have in my gun works and the system that I've, that I've kind of bought into. Um, and, uh, and I, I think that's just, it's just crazy. If people really have an idea of how much confidence I have in that gun, um, I have as much confidence in that gun as I do behind my bow. The difference is I spend an insane amount of time tinkering with my bow. And for yeah. me to have that confidence with my rifle without having had to do that tinkering I think is why I'm the guy writing that article because that is what Gunworks does in a nutshell. They don't just sell high end rifles. They're selling a system. Yeah. Yeah. No doubt. Well, man, excited to see those articles this fall. Uh, Really excited for, for our Idaho hunt coming up. It's going to be sooner than we think. I think it's almost time to start doing a little bit more e-scouting and prep there. Agreed. And uh, yeah. So, um, uh, give our listeners just a quick catch up. Uh, where can they find you if they want to uh, follow you on the socials or whatever else? Obviously, uh, check the Western Hunter for for some articles from you. Yeah, Western Hunter. I'm I'm pretty much in every issue. Have been for the last uh, six. Uh, so have been in pretty much every issue for the last nine months. Will continue to be in in pretty much every issue. A lot of archery content uh, series on Gunworks. Um, uh, gear reviews, that sort of thing. And then I'm on, uh, on Instagram mainly as well as my social media as Yates underscore in underscore the underscore backcountry. <laughs> Yates yep, all in the backcountry. Yeah. Yep. Gotcha. Okay. Awesome, man. Well, thanks for the time. Thanks for jumping on and uh, sharing a few hunting stories and uh, guys listening or watching this time, uh, give us some feedback. Let us know how you, uh, what, what you like and what you don't, and uh, we'll try and prove it. Until next time. Thanks, James. Thank you. All right. If you like what you're hearing here, please take a second and give us a five-star rating and a positive review on iTunes or on your favorite podcast app. We appreciate your feedback and suggestions for topics you'd like discussed or questions you want answered on the podcast. You can reach out on Facebook or Instagram or send us an email to podcast at gunworks.com. Also, be sure and check out our full offering of long-range gear at gunworks.com. Use promo code LRP for free shipping on any order.